Our next speaker is Stephen Kenny from Axis Communications. Stephen has 13 years experience in the industry and he manages the Architects and Engineers program for Axis Communications for Northern Europe. He's worked on high profile projects such as Wembley Stadium and the London Olympics. So I'd like to invite you to the stage, Stephen, to present Adding Value to Video. As all the other guys have made reference to their last visits to the Aviva, I am a huge rugby fan. So I've been here twice in Lansdowne Road once and I have yet to see England win. So I've been told I'm not allowed back in an England shirt. <laughs> so I'll give you a bit of an introduction. So yeah, Steve Kenny, I, I look after the architecture and engineering programme for Axis Communications for Northern Europe. So I'm a dedicated conduit between consultants and Axis. Um, we do actually have dedicated resource in Ireland as well, so it means that we can be sort of proactive in our approach to supporting the, the sort of consultant and engineering community. For those that don't really know that much about Axis, we are a Swedish company. Um, we've got about 2,600 employees now uh, globally, so this was based on last year. And that's largely to do with some sort of acquisitions that we've made recently as well. Um, we have been number one in network video pretty much since the, the day the IP camera was invented because 20 years ago we were the company that invented that camera. Um, but we've seen lots of sort of different sort of movements within the market and I guess when Paul made reference to the fact that there was 6.6 .6 billion sales of IP cameras globally in 2015, I think we represented about 15% of that market. Um, that is globally. Um, we are not a huge player in China, unsurprisingly, because there's lots of competition over there. So I think outside of China, we do represent closer to 30% of the global market. Um, so what I'll look at today is, I guess, some advancements in the technology itself, how we actually add value to, I, I guess, an image, video surveillance cameras. It's, it's not called closed circuit television anymore. It's called video surveillance because um, like the milestone approach, we try and open it up and work with lots of different companies and we look at the interoperability with different solutions to try and make it a solution rather than just an image. Um, but one of the first things I'd probably like to look at is the impact of the resolution changes from the actual an analog market that we, we've seen historically against the IP market. So a fairly easy slide. Um, what we generally find is this is a field of view um, and if you can see the, the small boxes that are, are drawn on that, what we essentially see is that the higher the resolution of the camera, the, the more the camera will see without actually compromising the resolution that we're actually achieving from within that image. So yeah, we can get the field of view, but what you'll generally find is that we may actually see pixels, sort of the density, um, there might be changes in that. So the higher the resolution camera, the more detail that we're actually going to see from within the same scene. So that goes all the way down to a 4K camera. In reality, there's far bigger, greater resolution cameras on the market. I know we have them readily available. So the higher the resolution camera, the more you will actually see from that image itself. Um, I would not expect everyone to be able to see that, but that gives a bit of a, an understanding on some of the actual distances that these cameras will see. So, so hopefully the terminology is identification, uh, recognition, detection isn't something that's new to the industry. Um, that was born from the analog market, but now what we're able to see is the higher the resolution the camera, the further the camera will see the same level of detail. If we look at a direct comparison against the two technologies, um, so the, the image on the left is an analog camera, uh, the image on the right is a three megapixel IP camera. So essentially the field of view is the same. Uh, we can capture the same, same level of scene within the actual camera. And what we've got now is we've got the, the person coming out of the building on, on both images. So, I guess from an operational point of view, we can see what we can see, but it's only when we actually interrogate the image, so retrospectively if we need it for, a, for actually, I guess, a prosecution or we need to go to the, the, the courts with information, uh, the level of detail that, it, that is needed is, is much higher if there's going to be a prosecution needed. So if we actually identify within the same scene the information that we want to see, so we want that gentleman's face. However, we're starting to see some pixelation within the image because when we're zooming in, because the resolu resolution's a lot less, the image is distorting. And essentially, that's what we're going to see on Crime Watch because 
If it's a good image, it does need to go on Crime Watch because we've actually got the evidence there. However, with a high resolution camera, there's more, there's more pixels, there's more information within the scene. So actually we don't get the pixelation. So the high resolution camera, the more information we're gonna see, the more information we're gonna retain. And I guess the, the, I guess the purpose of the surveillance camera is there to, to capture the detail. Um, I guess when we're looking at what is the, the detail that's required, so, so hopefully detection, recognition, and identification, these aren't, these aren't terms that are, are sort of new to the security market. This has been born from, from the analog days and the CPNI when they were looking at different standards to actually commission a system. And historically, it was, actually, it was actually done as a percentage of screen height. So that was 10%, it was 50%, or so it was 120%. And that was based on an analog technology. And the reason that that worked is because 99.9% .9 of analog cameras all had the same resolution. Um, whereas if you go back to the earlier slide where we have one megapixel, two, three, five, four K and beyond, the resolution changes significantly. So percentage of screen height doesn't work anymore because if you're going for a percentage of screen height, depending on the resolution of the camera will depend on the level of detail that you're actually going to see within that environment. So it's now done on pixels per meter or it's done, there's an equivalent now, so 10% um, for the level of detail. Uh, the EAN standards base it on 25 pixels, recognition 50, 125, and identification 120% at 250. So, the European standards have actually brought this information into their documentation because they've acknowledged that actually as a percentage of screen height, it doesn't work for the industry because we're not actually comparing like-for-like -like technologies regardless of the manufacturer anymore. So it is now done on pixels per meter or pixels across a face. Um, and, and that is the, the document that you will find in the EN standards now. So it gives you the direct comparisons against the terminologies, against the level of detail that you will achieve. So what does that mean in, in real money? So detection, so detection is there, so that is, we don't know what's happening within the scene, but we can see that there may be movement within the scene. If you've got an analytic that's being utilized, the analytic can send an alarm, an event, because it, it, it's noticing that there is movement within the scene, and that can create an actional event, an event to actually send an operator or send a security guard to actually go and investigate the scene further. Recognition, so, it is a, it's a higher level of detail now with recognition. So I recognize that I know that gentleman because he's my colleague, but you guys will recognize that you don't know him. Um, so again, it creates a slightly different sort of chain of events. Um, so you've got more detail, you either do or you don't know that individual. And then you've got your identification. Um, and essentially what that means is that the level of information and the detail there is that even if you don't know that person, you can identify a person like for, with like against the image um, next to it. So identity beyond reasonable doubt. Now the standards do have two options in there. So they have 500 pixels per meter and they also have 250. So it's 250 if it's a human operator actually monitoring an environment. Um, it's 500 pixels if you're looking at a solution like facial recognition. So facial recognition needs a lot more information. It needs a lot, a lot more pixels to actually identify against a subset of information within a database against the image that's being utilized. Uh, if we look at some different core technologies now, I guess we say a surveillance camera, if someone produces a camera and says it's got a really good image, that's probably the minimum standard that anyone should actually have as a requirement. All cameras, all technologies on the market, as a minimum, should provide a good image and good lighting. That, that, there's, there's no ifs, there's no buts, that is the minimum standard. However, there are lots of different environmental changes that can actually change how a camera will operate. So if you look at if you look at low light scenarios, um, Axis have a technology called Light Finder. Um, there are lots of different alternatives, lots of different flavors to Light Finder in the market, but it's how a camera will perform in, in really, really low light scenarios. Um, so within this environment, what we've actually got is we, we've got a comparison for how a, a Light Finder camera will work against a Nikon Cool Coolpix camera. So the image on the right is, is an Axis light finder camera and what it's doing is it's taking in all the ambient lighting from within the scene so we don't need to floodlight the scene. 
whereas the image on the left is essentially what the human eye is going to see. It's what the, 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 the Coolpix camera is going to see. Um, so we've got one walking towards the other, which you can hopefully see. So what we generally find is that we've got a really strong improvement within the image that's being provided. Now, this is a feature built into a camera, and you find all the manufacturers build it in now. This isn't a, this isn't a specific piece of technology. Um, if you look at the, the costs associated with the camera and additional lighting source against the light finder camera, the power associated with that is about 97% less because lighting can be quite quite thirsty and quite and can be quite costly over the life cycle of a system, whereas if you don't need to provide that additional light in, there's huge, huge savings to be made. What happens when you've actually got too much light in a situation? So there's lots of different wide dynamic capabilities, and, and essentially what we're doing within this environment is we're taking lots of different um, aspects within the scene. So what we had historically was an image where you couldn't see beyond an environment because there was too much light coming into it. But within a wide dynamic capability, you can actually utilize one camera to see directly in front of the camera and beyond the camera. And all that's essentially doing is running at, say, 90 frames per second, cherry picking the, be the best pixels for that environment and then stitching it all back together. And all the processing is actually done in the camera. So now we don't have multiple cameras doing multiple applications at any one time. You've got one camera that will operate in lots of different situations. Um, electronic image stabilizer. So hopefully no one suffers from photosensitive epilepsy because it does start shaking in a minute. Um, what we find is that one of the, the biggest areas to, to make cost savings is people are mounting external cameras on lighting columns. Now lighting columns are, are quite flimsy in comparison to a dedicated CCTV column. The actual, the actual construction is different, the fabrication is different, and all the civils associated with that are different. So what, what this video is essentially showing is the center is, is what the camera's doing, how the camera's moving. We've got the image on the right, which is a stream coming out without the electronic st image stabilizer switched on against uh, the image with it switched on, again, switched off. Now that is an extreme environment, and, and believe it or not, it was, it was developed for the transport industry where trains were going up and down trackside, because the largest number of suicides within in that environment are at trackside, but not at stations. So it was trying to find a technology that can actually monitor the environment. What we have here is lots and lots of pixel changes. So if you've got a milestone VMS and you've got your storage, the amount of pixel changes that we see there, it could even crash a network. Whereas with the technology the I switched on, it retains an image that would allow you to actually manage your bandwidth, manage the storage of the system, um, and just retain an, a usable image. Um, we have a, a technology now which is coming across the industry, which, which essentially is where a camera um, it, it enables the any rain or any sort of any sort of materials that are on a camera to be shaken off. So statistically, the biggest single point of failure with a camera that, with a wiper is a wiper. And what you'll generally find is if the, if it's, if the wipe has been damaged and it's still being used, it'll smear the image so then it becomes a usable, just becomes a camera that you can use but the image is unusable because the wiper doesn't work. So mechanically, what the camera will do now is it'll shake. It's a, it's a, I guess it's like a shaking dog when it gets all the, the water off. It shakes all of the, the water off the camera and it pulls to the bottom and it drops off and then the camera then becomes fully operational again. And again, when we work with the highways in, in the UK, this is a technology that they have, I guess, helped work with us in because it costs approximately £10,000 to actually replace the camera at the install because they have to close part of the motorway. The maintenance element is huge and that far outweighs the cost of a camera. Um, so just trying to provide different technologies in slightly different ways will enable them to actually reduce their costs of their system and the maintenance moving forward. So they're actually core technologies that we look at that are built into the, the actual product itself. If we look at intelligence at the camera, so there's lots of different creative things that we can do here. So over years, we, we've seen that the processing capabilities of a camera just means that the resolution has got higher and higher and higher and we are 
we're probably at 120 frames per second. We're, we're running at 30 megapixels. That's fine, but we've got to a point now where what do we do with all this additional processing power that sits within a camera? Because let's be honest, a camera now is just a really good computer that has, an, has a lens on it that creates an image. So if we look at Moore's law and what we've generally seen over the, the past sort of 10 years is that every two years the capacity of the processor doubles and, and this is something that we've seen in the common marketplace. Um, there's lots of different companies that have taken the approach now where actually we have free space, we have free processing power to sit within the camera. Now we all have smartphones, now I've got a I've got an iPhone, it does absolutely everything I want it to do except make a phone call, but that's probably the network provider rather than Apple, but at least it doesn't blow up like a Samsung. So whilst, we, whilst we've got all this free processing power, what can we do with it? So there's companies that have camera application platforms, so they partition the processing power in their technology, which enables them to work with third party companies to actually install their software into a camera. So now we've got a camera that will provide a really good robust image, but let's see if it can do something else and where, we can, where can we add some additional value. So I know Paul showed a, a similar video to this. So th this is a company that that worked with the UK government, so they worked with the CPNI, so it's looking at critical infrastructure. And the idea behind that is, is that they've gone and had it validated by a UK government organisation, which costs tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Now, Video Motion Intruder, analytics like that have historically been given a really bad reputation, and rightly so, because it was very expensive, it was difficult to, to commission, and it was unreliable. The false alarms were, were through the roof. Whereas the, the government, the, the eyelids approved analytic, it, it has a success rate of 99.8% accuracy. So there aren't many false alarms. There are little to no false alarms. So if someone gets an alarm and it's going back to a, a monitoring centre, it's, an, it's a, an event that someone will action because they know it's, an, it's a credible alarm. So now the software is put in the camera rather than sat on an independent server, which might cost a couple of thousand pounds. It's that you don't need all the additional cabling, the commissioning, and it's got an end user cost of not 16 pound nine, 169 pounds. So it's a fairly small cost and you can buy them as one-off licenses. But what's great with this is if you buy the camera on day one, you may not need this for three to four years down the line. So it is just future-proofing the design at the same time. If you look at analytics such as digital auto tracking, it's just a, a, a platform that enables the camera to do that little bit more without the need of an operator. So this is a fixed camera position. We don't have an operator controlling this. But what the camera's doing is it's monitoring the interesting movement within the scene and it's actually controlling what the camera will do. So it is a fixed camera, this isn't a PTZ. And all the camera's doing is tracking the movement and just positioning that back to a VMS. So within the milestone, what you will see is the areas of interest rather than the whole scene. It's quite a long video, this one. But what we generally find is that if there is multiple areas of movement within the same scene, the camera's not intelligent enough to realize which is of interest and which is not. So it'll always revert back to its home position. Uh, we have facial recognition now, so, so there's lots of different companies that are doing facial recognition and it has been absolutely ridiculous, the cost, but the more companies that are de developing this platform, the more companies that are integrating it, the more people that are using it, it's actually at a cost point now where it's actually a reliable and viable solution. And we generally see in retail it might be used for sort of gender recognition or age recognition, things like that, so people can actually market certain solutions in a certain way. Um, people are using it for access control, and Ireland's a fantastic example because you've got all these massive technology companies that are coming from the UK, uh, US, building data centers here, so you, your Googles, your Facebooks, your LinkedIn, they're, they're tech companies, so they want innovative tech solutions. So they don't want people walking around necessarily with certain types of applications, whereas if they can use facial recognition as an access control, fantastic. Um, but it will be integrated into the likes of ACT and, and ASA, so there are those alternatives. 
how do we work with, with sound as well? So there is a Swedish company called um, Squarehead Technology. So essentially they, they manufacture a solution that has lots and lots of different audio arrays. So within this environment, it records everything within the scene at any one time. This means nothing to any of us because it is just noise. But by integrating it with the surveillance system and, and throughout the commissioning process, they can identify specific areas within the scene that they want to look at. So they pick at the area that they want the camera to look at. And the integration and the commissioning with the audio tells the operator this is the associated audio with what that camera is looking at. So this can be done live or it can be done post events. And at the same time, it can be done in multiple scenes as well. So this, he's not very happy with that call. So it just, it just means that we can record all the audio and we can just integrate it with the video to actually add value to, to the scene that we're seeing there. There's companies like Sound Intelligence now that will install an application into a camera that can control what the camera will do. So if it's a PTZ and it's pointing in one direction and it hears a brake glass, the analytic in the camera will dictate where that camera looks at. At the same time, I think the studies show that 90% of all sort of attacks or aggression starts verbally. So if you can pick up in a, in a retail environment, in a bank, in a, a site like that where actually there's aggression starting and you can send an event to an alarm receiving centre who can actually come over a speaker and tell people you're being monitored, that diffuses the, the majority of, of incidents in that environment. There's companies that work with video smoke detection. Now, this will at no point ever replace a fire alarm system. It, it never will do, and there's, there's leg legislation and compliance that is based around that. But essentially what you can now do is you can, you can look at and monitor the pixel changes within an environment. So this may be the smoke, it may be gas, it may be different applications like that. And if we're in a, a large office and there's a fire in a bin, and the camera can pick that up, it will enable a security operator or somebody to go and extinguish that fire before it actually triggers the smoke head. And that may prevent an evacuation of 100, 200, even 1,000 people from a building. So if you look at the downtime and the operational impact that it can, it can actually have in, and improve on just by the CCTV system or the, the camera picking up on that analytic, there's huge, huge amounts of money to be saved on that. And again, if, if the camera's there and it can be used in a slightly different, slightly more creative way, then why not? Uh, I know Paul talked about uh, license plate recognition. Again, this can be done in the camera. It can be done in the VMS. Lots of different creative ways. Activity monitoring. So we're seeing this in a lot of building sites now, or you see this on the highways, where people are allocated an amount of time where they're allowed to work. And what an activity monitor will do is it'll use the, the surveillance camera to, to monitor an environment, provide a report saying how many people were, within, were in, within that environment at any one time. So if you're on the highways and you've given someone a window between 6 a.m. And, and 6 p.m. to work, what this will do is it'll tell them and it'll report back how many people were there within this environment. The, what's that? So they all had a nice two and a bit hour lunch break. So it's also telling them when they're not working. So there's lots of different ways that this can be done. But more importantly, it has the video to back up the reporting as well. So, so again, lots of different creative ways. There are even business intelligence applications. So the, the Centre of Retail Research did a survey across Europe. So they had about 40,000 responses and they were looking at a surveillance system and it was looking at how can we improve it and what do people want from it. So 80% of people wanted a CCTV system, a surveillance system to do more. And they thought analytics is the way forward um, and IP analytics is what they were looking at. So it's looking at various different cross-functional applications. People call it sweating the asset. So lots of different unique sort of platforms, heat mapping. So a couple of examples of that. Heat mapping, um, utilizing the camera, and all we're doing is taking the movement within the scene and creating a map over where people are going. So from a marketeer, they want to know, OK, we can position our bits of information here and there. From a security provider, they now know that actually that area is of interest. We either need to put somebody there 
or more importantly, we don't have coverage there, so we need to put some technology there. So again, it can be used quite creatively. You have people counting situations, so again, this can be used for this, this can be used for counting people in and out of businesses, but if you have an asset that you want to sell to people, you can actually go as a retailer and say, well, your footfall into your business is X amount, and we're going to charge you more money for that privilege. But from a, a life safety point of view, you then also have the opportunity to count people that are going in and out of buildings. And then likewise for queue management as well, it can make people more efficient in their approach. So if you know that actually between 11 and 12 o'clock on a Wednesday, we only need four members of staff on the tills, then we'll reallocate that resource somewhere else. It can make a business more profitable. At the same time, actually, it's all about the customer experience. So if you know that actually we only have four people on there and it's our busiest time of the day, actually we need eight, we can improve the customer service, which means we can actually make more money as a business. Um, so... Yeah, hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into, I guess, the added value that we can see within a surveillance system. There's lots and lots of different sort of opportunities for businesses to, I guess, support their end users. I guess for consultants, hopefully that's enlightened you on the capabilities that can be provided just beyond it being a, a CCTV image. Um, so thank you very much. Um, hopefully you found that of interest.